Thank you all very much for coming. My name is Adam Shalom. I'm the Dean for North America of the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism, as well as the Rabbi of Kohadash Humanistic Congregation in North Suburban Chicago. And you've joined us for a webinar on what comes next, rebuilding a Jewish history. It'll be a chance for us to explore past examples of challenges, even disasters and destructions over the course of the Jewish experience and ways that Jewish culture rebuilt after that crisis. Uh, perhaps we'll find some models either in what they had to let go of or in what they missed or in what they recreated out of the ashes of what came before. Just to give you an overview of what we're going to be covering, I've created a, a couple of polls which will give you an idea of the topics we'll be talking about. Uh, they will be the destruction of the first Jerusalem temple around 586 BCE, the destruction of the second Jerusalem temple around 70 of the Common Era, the Inquisition, persecution, and eventual expulsion of Jews from Spain and Portugal, the Tsarist pogroms uh, that happened during World War, uh, just before World War I, and then the disasters of World War I as well, and finally the Holocaust. Now I've seen someone has already voted before I even started talking which uh, shows you what uh, the challenge I have as a, uh, pr as a presenter. Um, and then the second question is asking which are the most relevant to the challenges we face today. So feel free as we're going along, if you choose to vote later, that's fine. I think you can even change your vote uh, as you go along, I'm pretty sure. Um, and then we'll talk about at the end what people thought were the most either important for Jewish civilization or the most relevant to the challenges we face today. Let me tell you a little bit about our perspective. Coming from a secular humanistic Jewish uh, life view, identity, we understand Jewish history as an important Jewish text in and of itself. For many Jews, when they study Judaism, they study what Jews wrote. The Torah, the Talmud, rabbinic commentaries, poetry sometimes, certainly in the modern period. Modern uh, short stories and literature also become Jewish texts. But for those who connect to Jewish history as the history of a people, and not just the history of an idea or a religious tradition, we want to understand what the people did, what they experienced, how they responded to the circumstances of their times. And so we look at Jewish history as a source of inspiration, not just as the backdrop for the writing of text. For us, the history itself can become a text and even a source of inspiration. Now, looking back at the origins of the Jews in the deep mists of archaeological past um, could be a depressing experience because, in fact, the very first mention of Israel in archaeology is not in a Jewish text itself. It's in a stele, a monument that was created by Pharaoh Merneptah. Uh, this stands in the Cairo Museum, I believe, in Egypt. Um, and the reference to Israel is not particularly flattering. Um, it's, in fact, a triumphal stele describing his conquest of the land of Israel and Libya and Canaan, which is the coastal plain today, uh, the land of Israel and uh, Lebanon. And notice the reference to Israel just in passing. Israel is laid waste and his seed is not. So the first mention of Israel in history is we destroyed them and they won't be around anymore. Uh, now, of course, this is, uh, you know, a chronicle of a death foretold that didn't happen, but it is definitely uh, not necessarily the way you want to begin your history. So let's look at another first in archaeological history, and that's the first depiction, the visual, of a Hebrew king that we find. And so here is the image, and you think, oh, this is a nice one. It shows the king uh, in charge with servants and uh, deputies. In fact, the Jewish king, um, Yehu of Israel, is the one bowing down with his tuchus in the air. He's paying tribute to the Assyrian emperor, Shalmaneser III. This monument was made around 825 before the Common Era. Now, one of the nice pieces about this is that it does provide some outside confirmation for elements of the Hebrew Bible's narrative. A lot of the Hebrew Bible narrative does not have archaeological justification. Certainly the patriarchs, the flood story, the Exodus story as well is very questionable. By the time we get to this period of a Hebrew monarchies in Israel in the north and Judah in the south, we have some confirmation. There's that Merneptah Steely mentioning Israel, whatever that meant, in 1200 BCE. And here we have a description of Yehu named by name, Yahuwah, which is pretty close to Yehu, and then it's referred to as son of Omri. And Omri is another king in the Israelite line, described in the Book of Kings in the Bible. And it's describing all of the tribute that he's bringing 
to pay off the Assyrian king, which is also described in the Bible's narrative. So on one hand, this is a wonderful confirmation of some element of the biblical narrative. On the other hand, it's not particularly flattering <laughs> to our sense of uh, self and image to see that our first mention is as a subject who has to pay tribute after a defeat. The key question that comes up when there is a disaster or a destruction is not just what happened, and that is part of Jewish tradition as well. If you uh, experience a traditional Tisha B'Av or the Ninth of Av, where there's fasting and mourning, you read a book in the Bible called Lamentations, which says what happened, what happened, how did it happen, why did it happen? It's wallowing in the disaster. But the next step is the next morning or the next week or the next month, you have to take a deep breath and put on your shoes and say, what do I do now? What happens next? A classic example of this appears in Psalm 137, which is also part of the traditional recitation of blessings before meals. It's called uh, By the Rivers of Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yes, we wept when we remembered Zion. And so part of the experience of destruction and exile, this is written after that destruction in 586 BCE, which we'll talk about in a moment, is looking back and remembering the past. But there's also the pain of the present. On the willows in that land, we hung our harps. Those who led us captive asked us for songs. They demanded songs of joy. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. They're being mocked and being told by their captors, sing a song of where you come from. And the key question appears, how can we sing Yahweh's song in a foreign land? How can we stay connected to this ancestral God of our kingdom when we're not in our kingdom anymore? Is it possible to maintain that identity looking back to a homeland where you're not there anymore? Can you survive in exile and diaspora? What do you do next? And so they decide to reaffirm their loyalty to where they come from. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I don't remember you. If I don't prefer Jerusalem above my chief joy. So this is sort of the positive side of remembering the good of the past, longing to return, having some idealism to move you forward. But there's also the other side, which is the negative. That is the quest for revenge. Remember Yahweh against the children of Adam in the day of Jerusalem who said, raise it to its foundation. Daughter of Babylon doomed to destruction. Happy shall he be who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Well, perhaps that's not a model for us <laughs> these days to seek revenge or to use anger or... Um, that's not a good foundation on which to build, we'll put it that way. Now, if you looked at the Jewish calendar, you could imagine it oriented around multiple disasters. And in fact, we'll see through the course of the Jewish calendar how many memories of disasters there are. Coming up in the next month is the Fast of Tammuz, which takes place on the 17th of Tammuz. It commemorates when the Jerusalem walls were breached by the Romans. Now, this particular one is a challenging holiday because it actually has a Babylonian precursor, and most likely this is a re-adoption or adaptation of the Babylonian observance of bewailing the god Demuzi into a Jewish context of fasting, and then they came up with an explanation later that the Jerusalem walls were breached on this date. That's probably not the original date, but re-adopting holidays with new dates is very popular in many cultures. Just think of Christmas in the wintertime as one more example. The fast of the ninth of Av, Tisha B'Av, which usually takes place in August, that remembers the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. Now it's claimed that this marks the destruction of both the first temple and the second temple, both the one that was destroyed in 586 BCE and the one that's destroyed in 70 of the Common Era. Now the really questionable part about this one is that there are sources in the Bible that disagree. One source in Jeremiah says it was destroyed on the seventh of Av. Another source in the book of Chronicles says it was destroyed on the 10th of Av. Well, which is it? The 7th or the 10th? Well, so the rabbis cut the baby in half to solve the problem and uh, declared that the 9th of Av is the day they will observe the destruction because the fire began on the 7th, it consumed the Holy of Holies on the 9th and smoldered out by the 10th. And that's how they explain away the contradiction in the biblical record by marking a holiday in the middle but it's still remembering the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. In fact, even breaking the glass at a wedding for many people has that echo as well. In the middle of the high holidays, after the new year of Rosh Hashanah, 
You have the commemoration of the assassination of a Jewish governor shortly after the conquest of Jerusalem called the Fast of Gedaliah. You have another fast in the month of Tevet, which marks the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in the sixth century BCE. You have the holiday of Hanukkah, which describes persecution of the Jews and uh, the defiling of the temple before it is ultimately redeemed by, shall we say, Jewish zealots. But again, the, uh, the claim is that Judaism, Judaism was at risk of destruction and yet was saved. The fast of Esther also commemorates the near destruction of Persian Jewry by Haman, as described in the book of Esther, and it appears the day before the holiday of Purim is currently observed. There's also a fast of the firstborn on the day before Passover begins on the 14th of Nisan, which is commemorating the 10th plague, which killed the Egyptian, Egyptian firstborn, but not the Hebrews. Again, this is one of those cases where, thank goodness, the story is a story and probably didn't happen because what an awful example of justice to have a divine plague killing children. Um, and then just past in our calendar, there's a holiday called Lagba Omar, which marks the 33rd day after the beginning of Passover. And that, according to rabbinic Judaism, marks the end of a plague that killed the students of Rabbi Akiva. So you can imagine orienting your Jewish calendar around disaster, disaster, destruction, destruction, disaster. And there's even the modern holiday that was declared by the State of Israel after its founding of a Yom HaShoah, a Holocaust Memorial Day. But the version you generally see Jews talking about when they're joking is this version of Jewish holidays, which is they tried to kill us, we're still alive, and let's eat. Interestingly, this chart actually does a statistical analysis of this process, and you'll notice the holidays are listed on the left, either as biblical, as rabbinic declared holidays, or as minor fast days that aren't as important. They are mentioned in the Bible in one or two passages, uh, but not by name, just as the fast of the X month. In any case, you'll notice some of the holidays are exactly along the stereotype. Rosh Hashanah, they tried to kill us. Well, no, they didn't actually. We're still alive. Yep, let's eat. Yep, there are foods for that. Yom Kippur, well, they didn't try to kill us, but yeah, we're still alive, but you don't eat because it's a fast day. And then ultimately, the stereotype version is something like the fast of Esther, um, or more likely Purim afterwards. Yes, they tried to kill us. Yes, we're still alive. Yes, let's eat. But that number is actually relatively small compared to all the holidays. In any case, if I haven't killed that joke yet by analyzing it to death, you get the idea that there are plenty of examples of disaster in Jewish history that have formed the basis of observances and holidays and could still form the basis of learning about our own experience. So the first disaster we wanna talk about is the destruction of the first Jerusalem temple around 586 BCE. This is by the Babylonian Empire, which is a very large empire based in Mesopotamia, the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, which is generally a more populous and therefore more militarily strong territory compared to the land of Israel, which has a lot less water and therefore less agricultural surplus. Egypt and Babylonia, when all things are equal, are the real powers in the area until modern times. And it's only later that the Jews are able to use technology to take advantage of the modern state of Israel. But before that time, when it was based on numbers and who you could afford to put in your army, Mesopotamia and Egypt were the powers because they had the agricultural surplus. So Jerusalem was ultimately conquered, the temple was destroyed, and the elites were exiled into Babylon. This is a painting by a European painter imagining uh, the people lamenting by the waters of Babylon, as we saw in that uh, passage. Now, the destruction of that temple in Jerusalem was a radical break with what had existed before. And one of the things we're going to talk about with each of these periods is what was lost and what was born. Because in every transition, destruction, rebuilding, there are things that you lose that don't come back, and there are things that start anew, and uh, you value them. But again, when you look back at what was lost, we can see echoes of things that we might feel are lost even today, and that we want to find ways to restore in some fashion. Um, now, the Babylonian destruction happened in 586 BCE, as I mentioned. There's an exile in Babylon, which we saw that uh, psalm from that period. And then there's a return to the land of Israel around 500 BCE and a rebuilding of Jerusalem and ultimately a rebuilding of the temple, what becomes the second temple. So what was lost? Initially, and most importantly, was Judean political independence. Judah was a separate territory. And uh, its destruction and the conquest of Jerusalem marked the end of political independence, which meant a change in identity. If your identity was to be a citizen of such and such a country, and that country is wiped off the map, what happens to you? And what happens to your sense of self? 
Another major change was there were no more kings. The idea of having a Hebrew king was deeply rooted in first temple period culture, um, but now this king has been destroyed. The, the, the monarchy is gone. The last king of the line of King David, which was the only authorized line for Judah, um, has all of his sons killed in front of him and his own eyes put out so that he is impotent, but is still alive. And so you can't replace him. And he vanishes into history. We don't know what happens to him in the end, um, but there is really no Hebrew monarchy to speak of after the destruction of this temple. And that's a very large change in how a government organizes. You know, any kind of regicide and transformation makes a big difference, and certainly this one does for Jewish life as well. Now, before the exile from Jerusalem and before the destruction of that temple, it would have been very common to find Hebrews who worship multiple gods. They might have put the Hebrew god Yahweh first, but they might have had other gods separate uh, or on the side. In fact, there's an argument among exiles in Egypt with uh, Jeremiah, who was a prophet before and after the temple was destroyed, where the women say to Jeremiah, everything was going great when we worshiped the queen of heaven. And since you told us to stop doing that, then the disaster happened. Well, in the long run, Jeremiah's argument is what wins and what makes it into the Hebrew Bible is the dominant voice, which is that you were wrong to do that. And we'll talk about what that version of monotheism looked like in a minute. And finally, the sense that your Judeanness or Jewishness, maybe in a later vocabulary, was based on living in a particular space was the basis of Judah as a separate territory. That was lost with this destruction and with this exile into Babylon and with that question, can we sing Yahweh's song in a foreign land? And finally, what might have been lost is the Ark of the Covenant to be rediscovered by Indiana Jones at some point in the 1980s. Now, what was born in this period? First of all, you have this new concept of some kind of diaspora, I call it Judaism. It's not quite Judaism as we think of it today, but it's some kind of Judean identity that doesn't necessarily depend on living there. One of the reasons why we know this began in this period is because after they were given the opportunity to return to Israel around 500 BCE, many Jews decided to stay in Babylonia. But they maintained a loyalty and connection to the land of their origin. They would send donations to the temple. They would make pilgrimages maybe once a year or once every few years to offer their sacrifices in the homeland. And yet they were Judahites living elsewhere, taking Babylonian names and worshiping, uh, not worshiping Babylonian gods necessarily, but sometimes running incantation bowls to deal with Babylonian demons or uh, evil goddesses and so on. So they were part of the surrounding identity, and yet they were also claiming an origin somewhere else that marked an exile, or we might now say a diaspora spreading out of Jewish Judean identity. A second thing that was born in this period is a kind of tribal monotheism. Now, you could have an abstract monotheism that says, you have a king god, and I have a king god, and there's all one god, and everybody talks about him differently. That's the sort of modern ecumenical version of monotheism. The Hebrew version of monotheism was, there's only one god, and he loves us the best. And he only speaks in Hebrew, and he only has one nation who's a, a nation of priests, and he has one city he loves above all the cities, and that's Jerusalem, and one people he loves above all the people, and that's the chosen people, the Am Segula, the people set aside. Um, so it's a kind of monotheism, but it's an evolution of a tribal god into being the only god. It's basically firing all the other gods or demoting them to demons and angels and not treating them as full gods at all. Another thing that developed in this period was instead of a monarchy now, you have rule by priests. Um, now, technically the term theocracy means rule by God. The problem is that God is very bad about answering his phone calls uh, or responding to messages. And so generally you have deputies of God who represent him and they're called priests, imams, uh, or other varieties of clergy. Um, so Judean political organization after the exile became a priestly theocracy. Now, we don't give our, the people who descend from these priests, whose last name are Cohen, Kahan, Katz, whatever, uh, we don't give them the kind of authority they had in this period. But what we do still have in many parts of the Jewish world, certainly the Orthodox Jewish world, is some version of theocracy, where clergy are in charge, uh, even if they claim to represent the will of God. Another development of this period is the final compilation of what today we call the Torah. Uh, there were pre-existing documents before the exile, most likely, that were later compiled during this exile into the final version of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible that we have today. And 
included in that compilation were wonderful literary stories, epics, sagas, uh, origin stories for everything from why we wear clothes to where the Jewish people came from. Also a whole series of laws, both ritual laws for the priests and ethical laws for the people. And finally, some elements of liturgy. If you've ever heard of something called the Shema, that comes from the book of Deuteronomy. And there are other examples of elements of traditional Jewish prayer that find their origins in passages from the Torah. And the Torah itself in rabbinic Judaism becomes a primary recitation as part of the, um, uh, the liturgy. So that's the first destruction, the first Jerusalem temple. The second uh, destruction and rebuilding we'll talk about is the destruction of the second Jerusalem temple, which was built around, again around 450 BCE, lasts into the Roman period in 70 of the Common Era. And here you have an image from the Arch of Titus in Rome, which depicts the conquest of Jerusalem and the despoiling of the temple, including some version of an Ark of the Covenant. You see, they must have rebuilt something. The incense shovels that they would have used to make offerings, and finally the menorah in the middle which is very recognizable with its seven uh, branches for the seven days of the week. And the Hebrew slaves, of course, are being taken away along with it. Um, now this destruction uh, led to a radical change in Jewish life because now you had no temple. There was no option for building another temple because the Roman Empire wasn't going anywhere. And so Judaism itself had to transform. You, when you had a temple in Jerusalem, at least you had everything, uh, one thing in common for everybody to argue about. You know, whether you hated the way the temple was run or you liked the way the temple was run or you offered in the temple or you traveled in a, as a pilgrim from far away, you had a place to point to. But with the destruction of that temple, we lost that universal Jewish center. You also have the ending of animal sacrificial worship. If you had asked a Jew before the temple was destroyed, what does it mean to do Jewish? They would have said, pay for animals to be sacrificed by the priests at the Jerusalem temple. After the temple is destroyed, they're not allowed to sacrifice anywhere else. And so that has to change. Uh, the priesthood, again, loses its power because it was based on a hereditary uh, rule. And they get a few honors in the synagogue, but not very much. And finally, one of the core ideologies of the Torah, which was represented by the way the priests ruled in that period of the second temple, was that you'd get your reward and punishment in this life. And the problem between the Maccabean persecution and the Roman persecution and this destruction of the temple was it sort of gave the lie to that claim that if you followed all the rules, you would live by them. People were dying precisely because they were following the religious rules. And therefore, this is why in rabbinic Judaism, you begin to get the idea of some kind of an afterlife, a world to come, a Gan Eden, a Garden of Eden. You see it reflected in liturgy and uh, the Talmud and other sources as well that that was a core part of solving that problem of why the Torah's promises seem to be off. What was born out of the ashes of that second Jerusalem temple destruction? Well, first of all, you had a decentralized Judaism. You lose the center, but now you get something called the synagogue. The synagogue actually starts shortly before the temple was destroyed for Jews who live too far away to make it to Jerusalem regularly, but it certainly explodes in popularity afterwards because now there is no center, you have to do it locally. And this also means that the leaders of Jewish life, who we begin to call the rabbis, have to be creative. And so they come up with an idea called the oral Torah. There's a written Torah, those five books of the Hebrew Bible, also called the five books of Moses. Um, but there's also the rest of the written Torah, would, uh, written, uh, sorry, Tanakh, Hebrew Bible, which the rabbis put together, and their commentaries and interpretations of those first five books called the Oral Torah, which allows them to respond to new circumstances. It also allows them to transform Jewish practice. Now you can't offer the sacrifices. So maybe you offer certain prayers in a regular routine pattern, just as the daily sacrifices would have been offered. And if you can't offer the animals on the altar, you'll at least read the passage of the Torah that describes offering the animals as a replacement for actually offering the animals. I sometimes say this is like telling God, I want you to know that I know what I'm supposed to do. I can't do it. You know why? Because you did it. But I want, you to, I want you to be sure that I'm aware that I would be doing this if I could. Now, transforming Jewish practice really meant substituting something new. And there are a couple of passages in an early rabbinic book called The Sayings of the Fathers that articulate this. On three things, the world stands. On Torah, that study of that revelation on the avodah, the divine service, that's the ritual prayer practice, and gemilut chasadim, the acts of loving kindness. There's also an alternative version of this saying, which is very nice, on three things the world stands, on justice, on truth, and on peace. 
you can't atone for your sins by sacrificing, maybe you atone by fasting, maybe you atone by penitence and confession, and maybe you atone by doing good deeds. There's an old rabbinic saying, tzedakah mitzil mimavet, that charity, righteousness, saves from death. Now, the rabbis also begin to create a whole body of Jewish law, in some ways as a way of trying to control their environment because they can't necessarily control everything, and so maybe uh, they can control what Jews do if they can't control the world around them. But having a set of religious law commandments also enables them to, again, explain why bad things happen. Um, after all, according to the rabbis, there are 613 commandments uh, described in the Torah, and many of them apply only to priests and ritual purity and animal sacrifice. But if you have a list of 613 commandments to follow, more than just the 10, uh, and people frankly don't do that well on the 10 anyways, um, what are the odds you have broken a commandment at some point that explains why that boulder came down a hill and crushed your house, or your child died in an accident, or any of the other terrible disasters that are part of the human experience? So religious law, paradoxically, serves to provide a kind of psychological consolation by giving explanations again for why these bad things are happening. The same problem of addressing what was lost earlier. And finally, you have a change in Jewish leadership. Now, instead of the hereditary priesthood, you have a more, I put it in quotes, democratized Jewish leadership because it wasn't heredity based, but of course it was only men and not women who could become rabbis until the modern era. Um, and there was always a sort of connivance between those with money and those with brains so that people who were smart and were successful rabbis could marry into rich families and then vice versa. And, and so it wasn't a pure democratized leadership by any means, but at least it was a more open approach that claimed merit and learning as the basis rather than heredity. Our third disaster is the inquisition and expulsion from Spain and mass conversions in Portugal. Now, after that second temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, Jews spread out all over the Mediterranean. Um, in fact, they had begun to leave even before. By the time that temple was destroyed in 70 of the Common Era, about a third of the Jews were living in Babylon, a third of the Jews were living in Alexandria and the Roman Empire, and another third were in Israel, but after that uh, great revolt and destruction, they were dispersed from there, and they were swept into Spain in the ninth century of the Common Era with the Arab conquest. Remember, the Arabs conquer the Middle East, they sweep across North Africa, they blow into Spain, they get all the way to Poitiers in France before they're stopped by Charles Martel and the snow, um, and they fall back to the Pyrenees, but they manage to occupy Spain for several centuries. Beginning in the 1200s, Spain begins what they call the Reconquista, the reconquering of Spain from Arab and Muslim rule. And this is where Jewish life really changes because the Jews who were living in Spain before this actually had a kind of a golden age because they were living among Jews and Christians and Muslims. They spoke many languages. They could be involved in government of various Arab states under the umbrella of the territory of Spain. Uh, they could become a vizier, which is like a prime minister or a foreign minister. They also worked for Christian kings at certain times. In fact, the Jewish population was so integrated with the Christian surrounding culture that they began to speak a language today we call Ladino or Judesmo, which is a medieval version of Spanish, um, not quite modern Spanish, but an earlier version, but written in Hebrew letters, um, much like Yiddish is medieval German written in Hebrew letters. And Ladino shows there was some positive interaction with uh, the surrounding Spanish Latin-based uh, language. However, with the expanding Reconquista and the increasing fanaticism of the Catholic Church in Spain, which takes off in the 1390s with some pogroms, some uh, anti-Jewish riots, as well as something called the Inquisition, which begins to investigate Jews who have converted but um, are claimed to be secret Jews, um, we used to call them Moranos, which is actually kind of an insulting name, so now we just call them Conversos. If they actually converted to Christianity and meant it, they're called Christians. Um, but if they converted and were hidden Jews, they're Conversos, um, and the Inquisition began to seek those Jews. Ultimately, as the Reconquista is completed in 1491, the uh, Jews and Muslims, by the way, in Spain are told they have to either convert to Christianity or to leave by 1492. And so many Jews choose to leave. Um, most of them actually just crossed the border into Portugal, which is a separate territory. But in 1497, there they are converted en masse with no option to leave and then not allowed to leave for another 10, 15 years or so. Um, so that's really where the most conversos appear when they're forced to convert and not given a chance uh, to leave as an alternative. 
but between these two episodes in 1492 and 1497, you have tens of thousands of Jews who uh, may be outwardly Christian, but um, are inwardly Jewish, or who have left these territories, but still have nostalgia and attachment to these, um, these old territories. In fact, in the uh, now Greek town of Thessaloniki, which at the time was called Salonika when it was in the Ottoman Empire, um, you'd have different synagogues named after towns in Spain. So you had the Cordoba synagogue and you had the Madrid synagogue because that's where they were from. So uh, the, the attachment continued even long after they were gone and they continued to speak that Ladino language into the modern period as well. But you can see on the map where tens of thousands of them wound up moving. Uh, some of them wound up in the Americas once that was open. In fact, they were able to come out of hiding there and the earliest Jews in North America in New Amsterdam were actually uh, ex-conversos who had come out of the closet when the Dutch conquered a particular uh, Spanish colony, and, and then they were reconquered by the Portuguese, and they had to flee because they'd admitted they'd been lying about being Christian. A lot of Sephardic Jews with that cover of being conversos wound up in London. Some came to Holland. You can think of Baruch Spinoza as one example of that community. Um, they also wound up largely in uh, the Mediterranean, whether it's in Italy, in uh, Greece, or in parts of the Ottoman Empire, in Jerusalem, uh, in uh, Beirut, but also in Izmir, in Istanbul, and as I mentioned, in uh, Salonika. And you see there's tens of thousands of them all over the place. Although we have to be careful because sometimes people call all Eastern Jews Sephardic Jews. There's technically a difference between Mizrahi Jews or Arabic speaking Jews um, and uh, Sephardic Jews who speak Ladino. In any case, what was lost from this experience? There was this multicultural dialogue among all these different peoples, learning Arabic and Ladino, as well as recreating Hebrew based on those cultural models. Um, they didn't have the access to Arab political power that had been there before, and they certainly had no access to Christian political power during the era of the Inquisition. And the Sephardic community becomes dispersed. You don't get a centralized location. And so again, just as those people ask, can we sing the song of Yahweh in a foreign land uh, 2000 years before, now the people who spoke Ladino said, can we speak Ladino in a non-Ladino land as we move? And finally, for those conversos, the idea of being able to publicly express their Jewishness vanishes. They have to hide it. Um, and they develop all kinds of interesting rituals of their own. There's a famous story about a mezuzah being hidden in the foot of a Madonna statue, so that when they kiss the statue, they're actually kissing a mezuzah and not the Madonna. But everyone outside thinks that they're being good Catholics and they're actually maintaining a kind of secret Jewish practice, baking matzah in closed rooms in the back of their uh, houses and all kinds of other creative examples. So what's born out of this experience? Well, first off, you have this Sephardi dispersion, um, which is uh, based on the map that we showed and shows the abiding identity of a culturalness beyond just a religious perspective, as I mentioned a little bit later. Um, we also have the arrival of both new Jewish mystical thought, where with this shattering experience of the expulsion from Spain and its persecution, a new style of Kabbalah or Jewish mysticism develops called Lurianic Kabbalah, named after Isaac Luria, uh, which becomes very attractive to these Sephardic Jews who imagine the whole world was shattered at one point, and we have to try to repair the world. This is where that phrase, tikkun olam, that many people are used to using today comes from, actually has its origins in Jewish mysticism. Um, as I mentioned, the idea of having a cultural practice beyond religion means you're speaking Ladino, and that's part of who you are. It's not just your religious beliefs, your kosher dietary laws, the synagogues you go to, but it's also the language you speak, the food you eat, the memories you have of where you came from before. And finally, the expulsion from Spain and Portugal is such a break with the Jewish past that we start to see Jews start to think about history itself. Before, the concept was we're in intermission. Real Jewish history happened when we were in the land of Israel and had a temple, and when the temple was destroyed and we were exiled, now we're in intermission, and we're waiting for the Messiah to return us to the land of Israel to rebuild the temple and to reestablish a Hebrew kingdom and the sacrificial worship. So whatever we're doing now is just waiting. You might remember a scene from the, um, from the uh, a movie or musical Fiddler on the Roof, where at the end, when they're being expelled from their town, they are uh, asking the rabbi, wouldn't this be a good time for the Messiah to come? 
And the rabbi says, we'll have to wait for him somewhere else. Doesn't matter, we're just waiting. Uh, we're running a little behind, so I'm gonna jump forward a little bit and not play the song for you that I had here, but if you wanna look it up, it's called Quando El Rey Nimrod, when King Nimrod went out into the fields. It's a wonderful example of this creative cultural dialogue because it's a story of, from rabbinic midrash that King Nimrod of Babylonia wanted to destroy Abraham, our father, when he was about to be born. And he knew he was about to be born because he saw a star in the sky over the Jewish neighborhood. Ever, have you heard a story about a uh, promised child being born with a star announcing his birth? <laughs> in fact, it's clearly a borrowing from the Christian story as well. Our next disaster, and again, a reminder, we have in the polling section the opportunity to vote on which of these you think was both the most transformative and also uh, the most relevant to today as we're going along. Uh, we have the Tsarist pogroms and the First World War. Between 1880 and 1920, you had waves of disastrous anti-Jewish riots in major cities and in small towns in the Russian countryside. And then the territories of Poland and Ukraine became the battlefields between the German and the Russian armies during World War I, and then between the Red Army and the White Army in the Russian Civil War after the declaration of a Bolshevik Republic, during which tens of thousands of Jews were killed. If they were killed in the hundreds in the pogroms in the 1880s, they were killed in the thousands in the disasters of 1915 to 1920. Um, and so that disaster, that destruction of large numbers of Jewish lives clearly had an impact. If nothing else, look at the migrations of 1,700,000 Jews to the United States, another 70,000 to Canada, 100, over 100,000 to um, South America, 240,000 into Western Europe, bringing their Yiddish with them, only 45,000 to the land of Israel, but that forms the basis for the founding of the modern state. 45,000 to South Africa, and another 5,000 to all the way to Australia. One example of the shattering dislocation of this experience is a poem written by Chaim Nachman Bialik uh, called City of Slaughter. I'm not giving you the whole thing because it's, it's even more gruesome than what I'm going to show you. But what Bialik does is he tries to explore why this happened and what does it mean. This was after the Kishnev pogrom of 1903 uh, which, uh, which killed about 45 uh, Jews. And here's what he writes. Arise now and go to the city of slaughter. Into its courtyard wind thy way. There with thine own hand touch the head, eyes of thine head. Behold on tree the spattered blood and dried brains of the dead. And he's not making this uh, sanitized. See the shattered hearth, attain the broken wall where they literally break into the house. N the open mouths of such wounds that no mending shall ever mend, nor healing ever heal. There will your feet in feathers sink and stumble on wreckage doubly wrecked, scroll heaped upon manuscript, fragments again fragmented, and again blood and blood. And he points out, you'll see the contrast of the thousand golden arrows of the sun, for God called the slaughter and the spring together. The slayer slew, the blossom burst, and it was sunny weather. He points out, you see two Mount, two people buried on a mound. Uh, both are headless, a Jew and his dog, the self-same act, axe struck both. Tomorrow the rain will wash their mingled blood into the runners, it will be lost, his cry will not be heard, it will descend into the deep, and all things will be as they ever were. Very fatalistic thing, but also challenging God who caused this to happen. And he challenges the Jews who saw their spouses and their daughters get raped, talking about the Jewish men who hid. And then instead of fighting back, instead of plucking out their eyes, they go to the rabbi and say, Rabbi, is my wife permitted to me now that she had sex with someone else? They're caught up in the legalism and not in the humanity. And so what was lost in those radical destructive experiences was again, the centralized Yiddish heartland that you saw on that map. There was at one time a confidence that Jews could be integrated into European society and be fully welcome there. And for many Jews, it was shattered by that experience. If not then, then certainly after the Holocaust. And some Jews had also imagined that they could separate Jewish religion from ethnicity. You could be purely religiously Jewish. But the experience of persecution in the Tsarist Empire didn't care what you believe or where you were from. Uh, it was simply an experience of ethnic conflict. There was also the unified experience of a traditional Jewish community and authority when you lived in a small Jewish town with rabbis who could have power over what you were doing. 
when you move to all those different new places in America and South America, uh, now you're going to find you can make your own choices in Jewish life and you don't have to do what the rabbi tells you. And finally, many Jews just got sick of waiting. They didn't want to wait for the Messiah anymore. So what's born out of this period is the vast geographic dispersion of Ashkenazi Jews. You have get these two modern Jewish movements who are both impatient with Messiahs. The Zionists say, we're not waiting for the Messiah to move to Israel, we're doing it now. And the Yiddish socialists say, we want a paradise, but we're gonna build it here, where we are, in the language we speak, and with allies from other socialist parties. Uh, we do get the experience of more diverse Judaisms. There was Reform Judaism before this period and conservative, but now it becomes the dominant experience of Jewish life, that there are these multiple options and vibrant multiple options in Jewish life, including secular Jewish options. Plus, when you leave that unified traditional Jewish community, you can decide if you want to work on Saturday or if you want to eat non-kosher food. You have a private space that's different than when you were in the shtetl and everybody was watching you all the time. Uh, and so Jews begin to practice less uh, the traditional practices and make their own choices when it comes to how they do Jewish. And finally, the mass Jewish presence in North America comes from this period. So that is something that's born and built. Uh, most of the Jews in Canada and the United States trace their ancestry to that migration. Now, obviously, we can't talk about Jewish destructions without mentioning the Holocaust. And I want to show you a couple of art images by Shmuel Bach, who's a Holocaust survivor himself, that I think do a very eloquent way of describing the destruction. On the left, you see a black and white picture of a tree, but notice the tree is artificially bolted up in the air. It has no connection to its roots. The roots, in fact, are on a separate box elsewhere. It feels like it's been dug out of the ground. There's a half a wall in the back that's crumbling. Um, and you see things sort of uh, trailing onto the ground. Is this a document of hope? Well, this tree has a little new shoot that's coming out of it, but the old tree is withering and dying. And if you notice, the leaves at the top are in the shape of Jewish stars. The picture to the right is obviously an echo of a famous traditional picture, the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel. But notice what's different in this version of the creation. First of all, Adam is much less attractive. He looks much more like a prisoner, um, whether in prison or, or a Holocaust era. You'll notice behind his head is a bomb. You'll notice under him is debris, disaster, destruction, a broken chair that's not even worth sitting in. And notice the image of God. The hand is artificial, it's held in the air. And God itself is an empty space left by the crumbling of a wall. Again, you see the wall held up by jerry-rigged poles here. And in the background, the most you see of the God is in fact smoke from a chimney. And in the Holocaust era, smoke has a particular resonance. So the Holocaust destruction clearly was significant. We lost one third of world Jewry and half of the Jews of Europe. The heartland of Yiddish language and culture was destroyed along with those people. Also for many people, the belief that progress was inevitable and civilization would, would proceed. I mean, Germany was the home of scientific and cultural avant-garde experience and, and look what happened. And also in many parts of Eastern Europe, especially in Warsaw, but also in Berlin and other areas, you had this, what I call a mass lived experience of mixed practice Jewish communities. Whereas after the war, um, you begin to see both in, Amer in North America and in Europe and, and in Israel as well, a separation of these communities into their own little bubbles. And so now you find it much more the case that liberal Jews tend to live next to liberal Jews and Orthodox and even ultra-Orthodox Jews tend to live uh, among their own style of Jews. Now what's born out of the Holocaust, obviously modern Israel is formed in the aftermath and with some of the sympathies that were created by that. We also have a new Jewish self-assertiveness in response to the persecution of the Holocaust, the need to stand up. There's the ongoing distinction of Jewishness from religion because the Jews in the Holocaust, like in the Tsarist pogroms, were not persecuted because of their beliefs. And so Jews begin to think, maybe my Jewishness is an ethnic one. If I would be persecuted by Hitler, then uh, I can't simply let it go. But you also get a new paranoia about Jewish disappearance. And there's sort of two directions of this fear of Jewish disappearance. One is the fear that they'll persecute us to death and there'll be new pogroms and new Hitlers coming. And the other is that the outside world will love us to death and we'll simply uh, marry other people and disappear that way. 
Um, in fact, recent uh, data on intermarriage shows it's a more, much more complicated story. And in fact, increasing numbers of families with one Jewish partner, one non-Jewish partner are raising their kids Jewish. So that fear may be abating a little bit if we read the studies, but the fear certainly has its roots in this period of an almost Jewish destruction. And finally, just as we saw the, um, the idea of understanding Jewish history in the now starting after the expulsion from Spain, now we have a demand for Jewish memory. We say never again will we suffer something like this. We have to remember. In fact, remembering the Holocaust is one of the highest ranked items on surveys when they ask what counts as doing Jewish for you. And remembering the Holocaust is very high on those lists. So here we are in the age of COVID-19, and I haven't filled in any answers to what's been lost or what will be born because we don't know the answers to those yet. That's still in process. Um, and maybe we'll talk a little bit in the discussion of what has been lost and what will be born out of those tragedies. But I do wanna share with you as a last piece, a short piece of the poem Easter 1916 by W.B. Yeats, who wrote this in the aftermath of the Irish Revolution, because I think that the key line is the end that even the creation of something wonderful, like an independent Irish state, was done in blood and disaster, and it changes you in some way, every destruction and every rebuilding. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. Oh, when may it suffice? That is heaven's part, our part to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child, when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. What is it but nightfall? No, no, not night but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith for all that is done and said. We know their dream, enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse, McDonough and McBride and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Looking at the questions in the poll, um, I'll end it in just a minute. Again, a reminder, it's asking you, which of the rebuilding after disaster moments was the most important for the development and change of Jewish civilization? And which is the most relevant for what we face today? I mean, I think we can draw interesting lessons from each of those periods. You know, the destruction of the first temple meant that we had to do our identity at a distance. That sounds familiar, right? <laughs> to maintain connections, to try to stay um, engaged, when we are far away from the people or the places that we want to be, uh, that's something that we have to be able to do now. The second temple period, the idea of reinventing and changing what we do and how we do it um, is definitely important because we're changing how we're doing services and we're changing how we're teaching and we're changing how we're connecting to people. Um, and so whether it's in Jewish life or in human life or in doing good life, I know all kinds of people who are desperate for ways to do community service because they can't, they can't find a way to do it. You can't volunteer at a food bank. You can't serve things. I mean, maybe you can give blood that's still available, but it's so much harder to do good. And people want to do good in moments like this. Um, so we have to find new ways to do that. And having the end of the sacrifices and the beginning of prayers made a big difference uh, in Jewish life too. Um, in the inquisition and expulsion from Spain and Portugal, um, this perhaps is more relevant to us today, maybe as Jews facing anti-Semitism in the broader society, and the need to be visible, both as Jewish communities and as, and as individuals. Um, but I think it also uh, talks about nostalgia. And we think about the world that was and the kind of things we would have wanted to do, but don't have the chance to or the opportunity or the safety to be able to do now. So just as those Sephardic diaspora residents remembered Madrid, remembered uh, Catalan and other places when they named their synagogues, so too we want to remember what life was like before to see what we can bring back and what we can bring with us from that period going forward. In terms of the czarist pogroms in the World War, while many of us involved in secular humanist Judaism still feel those echoes of secularization, of separating religion from um, ethnicity and uh, finding new ways to be Jewish. And again, as I mentioned, the dispersion, that's still part of who we are. I mean, if nothing else, um, it's, good to be Jewish because it teaches you to not be only one thing. The whole idea of multiple identities is very familiar to us because it's who we've always been. And then finally, the Holocaust, we know there are still lessons to learn from that for sure, um, both in terms of dealing with broader social issues that we're facing, but also in how to deal with the loss of large numbers of people, the idea of memory, how we remember 
this COVID-19 period? What kind of rituals will develop? What kind of new holidays? Would we add one to the Jewish calendar? We have enough fast days as it is. Do we need another one? Or maybe we find other ways to mark it in our own sense of legacy and memory. So I'm gonna end the poll just before we're done and I'm gonna share the results with you. So you can see um, the winner of the first one, which was the most important for developing Jewish civilization, was the destruction of the second Jerusalem temple. And uh, tied for second was the pogroms and the expulsion from Spain. But which is the most relevant to today, overwhelmingly the Holocaust uh, is the leader for that as well. But hopefully this was a good example for you of what it means for us to do Jewish by using Jewish history as a primary source and as a resource to be able to find out what happened in the past and also find tools to address the future. If nothing else, I hope this has given you hope in the fact that you've seen that we faced disasters before. We've survived the first temple's destruction and our first exile. We survived the second temple's destruction and having to create the synagogue. We survived the expulsion from Spain and having to learn new languages and keep old languages. We survived the czarist destruction and the redefinition of who we are in several different directions. We've survived our own diversity, which came out of that. And most importantly, even though there was a Holocaust and we lost a third of our people globally, we have survived. We are just now about back to the numbers of what Jewish life was before the Holocaust. And so in the words of an old Yiddish song, Mir Zainan Do, we are still here. So if you remember that chart of the Jewish holidays, they tried to kill us, they failed, let's see. Well, whether or not you choose to eat, they failed, we're still here, and we're still creating new Judaisms. And that I think is the sign of life. And it gives me hope, even if we don't know what we've lost yet and what we have uh, yet to build anew, that we will build anew and it will be different but different can be good.